Matthew chapter 17, please. Now, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, brought them up to a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. This, this appearance of Elijah is of, a, of importance. I want you to grasp this. Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three sacred tents or booths, tabernacles, see, uh, for us here. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Now, of course, do you, you, you grasp the significance of making these three booths? Because it's, it's, it's corresponding to the Feast of Tabernacles, you understand? All right. Uh, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Hear him. You see, why would Peter try to say, build three booths? How many ever wondered about that, build three little tabernacles? It sounds nonsensical, except here was it like it was in the wilderness with the glory cloud of God above them, you see? And Christ himself is transfigured. And to, to him, there was a, an association in his mind immediately. This was likened unto the original days of tabernacling in the wilderness. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and they were much afraid. Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. Lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. And as they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? You see, before uh, you grasp this, they said, Elijah has to come first. And he answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. Grasp this? But I say to you that Elijah already came, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. Of course, another place, uh, he, he, they said, he said, Elijah has already come, and they did to him whatever they wished. So you grasp, you, do you grasp in your mind the significance of Elijah's ministry? Whether you want, however you want to accept this, you can say, well, uh, John the Baptist then was a reincarnation of Elijah. Well, you can say that if you want to. Or you can say that the spirit of Elijah was resting on John the Baptist. Or you could say that the spirit of Elijah will again rest upon people in the end time when the day when the restoration of all things will come. Uh, we're in that day. There's been more of the real truth of the word and the experiences of the word restored in the last four or five hundred years, but especially in, in the last, in the la within the last generation. More has been restored than you can imagine. The dark ages were exceedingly dark for the church, but it's in this day that the Lord has restored the miracles, the signs, the gifts, the wonders, the clear understanding of the experiences of, the of receiving the Holy Spirit, being filled with it, of looking for the Lord's return. Many things have been restored in our generation. We, we see first rather faulty, er erratic thing. Most all of us watch the big healing ministries that come up and I think that they leave a kind of a stench ultimately wherever they go there are miracles of healing but the commercialism of it and the various things but thank God at least was a, a step and you know God is showing even the more perfect way the path of the just shineth more and more under the perfect day that's not true the rest of the world the rest of the world is watching darkness come upon them. But we are to see the Elijah ministry restore all things. This is the reason that it's very significant during the Feast of Tabernacles that we study the ministry of Elijah and Elisha. These, this, these are the days of the double portion. If you look back, at Isaiah prophesies that in, upon the end time remnant, there will be a double portion of the Spirit resting upon them. Elisha, if you remember, was the prophet who asked that he would have a double portion of the spirit that was resting upon Elijah. I have at home what we call the uh, book 
Encyclopedia Britannica, a number of volumes. And I can remember several years ago, I haven't touched the book lately, uh, <clears throat> but Encyclopedia Britannica said that Elijah was a mythical figure, that he had never really existed. But it's strange that Jesus went up with Peter, James, and John on the mountain, and they saw Moses and Elijah. Wasn't that, and, and the scriptures say that they were talking with Christ concerning the things about his coming death and so forth. Yeah, that boy, that Jesus was talking to a myth, huh? How about that? Uh, there's so many things that people are so ready to reject that are so verified in the life ministry of the Lord through the communication that was there with him. The, Malachi did prophesy that Elijah was going to come. If you remember, let's see, in the last chapter of of Malachi, he said, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse or with uh, destruction. That is in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, if you want the reference now. Now, we, we threatened that we were going to go to 1 Kings, and now we will. Do you begin to understand that anything that you read in the stories of Elijah and Elisha, you, you are dealing with the prophet of restoration and the prophet of the double portion. And this message today, I think, um, we'll move through it as rapidly as we can, is 1 Kings chapter 18, and since the chapter is rather lengthy, I'm going to ask that, that we'll skip along from one place to another. Amen. Elijah had a way of life that has just been really real to my heart. I remember a number of years ago, my idea of being blessed was that would be to have a comfortable home and a nice car to drive and a little money in the bank. I can't tell you, I've been preaching the word for quite a while. I suppose the 1930 four or 35 is when I started preaching the word. And I can remember how many times after we, Sister Stevens and I were married, that we would try to save so we would finally have a hundred dollars, hundred dollars in the bank. We worked on that thing for years. We couldn't get it. But, we'd, but living as an evangelist and going from church to church and so forth, we've lived under churches, we've lived over churches, we've lived behind churches, We've lived beside churches. We had to more or less create a, uh, our own way of life, our own lifestyle. Even when Grace Chapel was built, we, I remember we sent our kids back to be with my parents for a semester, and we pitched in with all we knew how to do. And we converted the upstairs into the quarters where, where the Swartz are living at the present time. Worked hard at that. We lived there five years, but that would eliminate overhead because we couldn't afford to even pay rent. And the house we had, we'd sold it, put the money in the church. So we knew what it was always to live sacrificially, always to just wonder about certain things. And I had it in my heart uh, uh, that there would be a lifestyle in which you'd have everything that you really needed. Didn't have to be greedy, but, you know, you can only drive one car at a time and you can only... Uh, wear one pair of pants at a time, one pair of shoes at a time. So who needs too much of this? But it, it has been so impressed on me that in the walk, our whole idea of a good lifestyle has changed. We no longer are thinking about comforts and so forth. We aren't thinking about that anymore. What are we thinking about? We're thinking, I think we think like Elijah, to tell you the truth. Our thinking is a lot like Elijah's. Now, Elijah could live in the wilderness, or he could come down and he could... Preach the word to him. It didn't make any difference. A, a wilderness is only effective when you think you're in a wilderness. As long as it's a real experience to you, you're in a wilderness. There's some people will never get out of it because they, they always are protesting everything. I know one minister, I'd just give anything in the world if I could change his way of thinking. One of our young ministers in the walk, they just can't get over the idea that he doesn't have anything and that he isn't blessed. And because of that, he's grabbed for things and Finally, it just goes through his hands. And, and I, I feel sorry for him. And I've talked to him about it, but it doesn't register. You say, well, the Lord gives you this, and the Lord gives you that, and the other thing. But you folks that know me know how that gets given away, too. 
fact, we made a deal last night. We're going to get another. We, get, we walked into a little lot that's going to be worth some money. And Sister Young says we can get about $11,000 for it. Well, I hope it'll turn fast because we need that money. There's so many places. <laughs> that's Cayucas lot, Martha, in case you're wondering. All right. The, as fast as we get something, we just look to the Lord to bless it, find a good sale for it, and you know where it goes. You've seen it year after year. And the Lord blesses us. Uh, if I had hung on to everything that God ever gave me, I would be probably a fairly wealthy man. Instead of that, I'm more in debt today than I certainly was the day I started out to preach the word as a boy. That, uh, and probably it'll get worse before it gets better. Not the kind of debts that you might imagine, but the things that you incur because you want to see the Lord move. Right, let's get over this idea that we have to have comfort, we have to have security, we have to have anything. The Lord is our security. And Elijah comes up out of the wilderness to proclaim his word. But it's significant that when he does in this chapter, he's not thinking about himself being in a wilderness because he has been the instrument of God to bring a judgment Wilderness, a wilderness of, of literal judgment upon the whole world. For three years it has not rained. Do you think a lot of this is in your mind anyway? If you think you're blessed, you believe to be blessed, you'll be quite happy with it. But some people will never be happy. Bring them out of Egypt where they're being beaten every day as slaves, and put them in the wilderness and they'll murmur in the wilderness. There are some people who will murmur no matter where you put them. There are some people that never are blessed. You can't do enough for them to bless them. They'll still whine. But there's other people that learn to just rejoice in the Lord. And when they do, they, they begin to understand that the joy and happiness are not really dependent upon the external circumstances. They, are, they depend rather upon the internal condition of your spirit toward God. And if you have a spirit that's right toward God, whatever the other circumstances are, there's a joyfulness that comes up. Well, if you, if you think I'm not going to be blessed until God does this and that and the other thing for me, you never will be. There's always people who are always reluctant to trust God. Well, when God does this for me and that for me then, and works this out for me, then I'd like to really be of service to the Lord. Why don't you start now? Serve him now. Let him bring the joy and the blessing to your heart. Get away from the murmuring and the discontent. And learn to live with the Lord in this generation. Amen. Well, I read the newspaper and I worry about what's coming to pass. Then don't read the newspaper. <laughs> it bothers me when I think, well, what's going to happen? Then don't, don't worry about it. But, but the bills, no, put them in a the drawer, shut the drawer. <laughs> All the work that's to be done. Well, you don't want it to wear you out, so lay down and take a nap before you approach it. And then go after it with all of your heart and soul, mind, and strength. Without any reservation in your thinking, learn to just abandon yourself to that. I suppose, and I could get very discouraged, because my work's never done. It's never done. And every year it's never done even more than it was never done the way you... <laughs> year before, if you could understand an Irishman's way of talking now. Uh, it's true, you, you just look at it and the pile is bigger. But I have the boxes of undone work more carefully organized these days than ever before. I had to do that because they were taking up so much room we couldn't get around the kitchen. <laughs> now, we've got everything just pretty well worked out. We've got a lot of cooperation, a lot of help. Sister Bessie will take the boxes of work that I have and take them up to the office for me and they're out of sight and we just trust the Lord. But you'd be surprised though, you look through the work of last year that you didn't seem to have time for and you realize that just believing God, project after project by the hundreds were really accomplished. God got the thing done. Really did. But this is a long introduction. You folks aren't listening fast enough this morning. Let's listen a little faster, shall we? First Kings chapter 18. Now it came about after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, the third year of a famine that began in the, in the uh, first verse of chapter 17. Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. Then there's something like, oh, at least six chapters or so that are devoted to King Ahab in the Bible. Whereas most of the kings, even some good ones, were lucky to rate half a chapter. And you say, how could th this, this old Jezebel lover, that was his queen Jezebel, rate so many chapters in the Bible? 
Well, the reason for it is, that, of course, if you understand it, is the story of Elijah is there. And God, God devotes more, more chapters to a man like Elijah or Joshua or Caleb than he does to creation. He gets rid of creation in two chapters. <laughs> but boy, he moves in and he talks about these men in whom he delights. Amen. I'd, well, amen. <laughs> I would rather have walked with Caleb through those years than to, than to witness creation, to tell you the truth. For the sense of perspective has to be in our mind. God loved this old man Elijah. Now, so uh, what did he say to him? Go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the face of the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Understand this. Obadiah is over the king. He's sort of an administrator in the kingdom. And he, Ahab and Obadiah, are going through the land searching where they can find some water so that they'll not have to slaughter the cattle because they were dying of thirst. It's reached such terrible proportions that the, the flocks and the herds were dying. And uh, Obadiah is on his way and Elijah comes to him and he, and he says, Is this you, Elijah, my master? And he said, Yes, it is I. Go say to your master, Behold, Elijah is here. Now here's where we get a little hassle. Obadiah says, Now, he says, I know what's going to happen the minute that uh, I go to tell Ahab that you're here. And then, meantime, perhaps the Lord will just catch you away someplace. When I come, you're not here, and then Ahab's going to kill me for it. He says, no, he says, I'll be right here. <laughs> now, verse 15. Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. We live in a day in which men have various kinds of titles, you know, Ph.D., D.D., L.T.D. <laughs> Was that right? <laughs> but usually when D.D., so forth, usually these degrees that ministers have are degrees of frost and freezing. <laughs> At, and they are given to bring a certain honor, but they don't necessarily mean that this man is a real man of God and he has anything at all to really present. I want you to understand. I have nothing against uh, education, I, although I believe it's been wasted on a lot of people. Don't you? Yes. I, we always are sending our young people right into as much, as much education as they can possibly be disciplined to, to handle. That's not the... That's not the point, but it, it doesn't seem like that all the education in the world still enables some people to discover the areas of their own rebellion and ignorance. Now, this man Elijah had a distinction. We don't have D.D. He's not called a reverend. Amen. He's not called a reverend. Amen. But there's something about this old boy that you have to admire. Over in 2 Kings chapter 3, when they're talking about Elisha, now, when they called for Elisha, in the end of that 11th verse, 2 Kings 3.11, he said, Where, where's the prophet? They said, well, here's Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Amen. Now we, we have another kind of distinction. We don't say, here's Elisha, who holds credentials with the school of prophets, and he's a very eminent man of religion. Uh, and so on. No. Well, how can we identify this prophet? This is Elisha. Who's Elisha? Oh, don't you know? He was the one that poured water in the hands of Elijah. <laughs> well, who's Elijah? Everybody knew who Elijah was. But back here earlier, when, when the eminence of his ministry was coming forth, he said, Elijah says, as the Lord of hosts stands. I'm Elijah. Who are, who's Elijah? I'm Elijah who stands in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, that's, that's a pretty good title, too. <laughs> that's about as good a title as you can get. I'm Elijah who stands in the presence of the Lord. In this day, I, I know from the prophecies that came when I was much younger, and the Lord spoke that the words would, would come. I, 
Let's see. That would go back to about 1950. The Lord said, I'm going to give you the words and the teachings for my people. And when hands were laid upon me and ministry came over me, the first time that I had experienced multiple ministry of hands and prophecies over me, although the Lord had given many revelations before this, the Lord spoke that by the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge, I would lead and teach the people to bring them into what God had for them and that they would come from the east and the west and the north and south. And now, for close to a quarter of a century, we've watched it happen. People from all over the world have come and received a word from the Lord. This is true. And I, I think the thing that God spoke then is of great significance. He said, it will be a long season before my people everywhere will accept the word that I give you. That's been true. So the persecutions have been on and rejection. But isn't it strange that as the, every year that goes by, there's more and more of God's people that reach in and embrace this word. One of the eminent leaders of the charismatic movement used to be very vociferous in, in proclaiming how, much, how wrong I was. And yet, one young brother came from him the other day and he said, he said that the purest teaching to be found on the earth today is to be found in Brother Stephen's writings. Hallelujah. Now, isn't that strange? Once he called me a false prophet. But he weighed and he listened, and in time, God began to get through to his heart. I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't matter what people think about you if you can be just like Elijah and just keep on standing in the presence of the Hallelujah. Lord. <laughs> Amen. That's all. Just stand in the presence of the Lord. If the Lord accepts you and you stand in his presence, what more could you really ask for? Amen. Don't be touchy and sensitive about this. Don't strive to be well thought of by many people. I think that's a waste of time. It is a waste of time. I think as much as lies within you, you should live peaceably with all men. You should strive with everything that's within your heart. But nevertheless, we're chosen as instruments of grace as well as instruments of judgment. And the Lord intends to do something so quickly in the earth that it, it, it's, not, it's not possible for the word that we preach to, to rest somewhere in books for two or three hundred years until another ge generation would rise up in some distant point and begin to re-examine the teachings, reprint them, and there would be great revival in the earth. We don't have that much time. This gospel of the kingdom has to come for a witness. It has to be a thing that reaches to the ends of the earth. Amen. Men must face the word, and God will bring them rapidly into decision. And in a short season, he'll deal with their hearts, and they will have to decide whether it is the word of God or whether it is not the word of God. Amen. Amen. You know that's true, too. Amen. How many are aware that as you, you get it, it's just almost too much for you? The word comes and it just overwhelms you. And you ponder it and you weigh it. But as you do, if you love the Lord and you seek him, it becomes a revelation to your heart. It is not a thing that is proclaimed to you by some super salesman. And it comes to you and it startles you and it shocks you. But as you open your heart, God reveals to you, this is my word. Amen. And when it becomes a living revelation to you, you realize this did not come from man. It came from the Lord. And you become another human channel that's going to proclaim it as the word of the Lord. Amen. Well, let's go on a little bit further, shall we? Now, they arranged this setup and to meet uh, Elijah. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And it came about when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? <laughs> And he said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. Now then, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal, and 400 prophets of Asherah, or Ashtoreth, uh, pronounced variously. In other words, she was the wife of, and the, god, the goddess wife of Baal. Understand? And she is to be, what, the goddess of fertility? Anyway, com combined in this, they, they worshiped a great deal uh, 
with the, with the priests officiating. One of the things that you have to realize is that this bloodthirsty old Elijah, before the day's over, whacks 450 prophets to Baal to pieces. I used to say, what a terrible thing. You know, well, no wonder he was so tired, you know, that, <laughs> that's a lot of work. I can remember a time that just butchering a pig on the farm was a full day's work, you know. But imagine if you had to butcher up 450 prophets of Baal. See, what a bloodthirsty idea. Well, let me tell you something about that. The prophets of Baal, according to history, were the ones that took the children that were born and slaughtered them. Do you understand that? Uh, they would continually slaughter the infants in sacrifice. And no one could kill a child except the prophets of Baal. And so these 450 prophets are the worst type of murderers. They have to be slain because wherever the idolatry would have been, these were the men that were authorized to kill, that had killed and would kill all the future children that they could at, at the hour of birth. Now, I begin to approve more heartily of what the, Elijah did, don't you? When you think of all the innocents that had been slaughtered. Now, they, they bring them up here to Baal, and notice Elijah came near to all the people. This is on Mount Carmel. How long will you hesitate between two opinions? Amen. If the Lord is God, follow him. Then if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Elijah couldn't force them into making a decision. The indecisiveness right now, people over the words from the Lord, is just staggering in the land. Yes. They'll, they'll tell you over and over, oh, I'm so hungry for the Lord. Are they really hungry for the Lord? You put them in a corner and decide whether they're going to stick with Babylon or whether they're going to re really walk with the Lord. And they won't answer your word. That's right. They'll halt right between two opinions. I used to be very much impressed when people would come to me so they say, oh, that minister's really hungry for God. Yeah, hunger, smunger, I don't know. Uh, uh, I've, I've seen too many of those hungry men come around like Nicodemus by night, and you give them a word, boy, that's right on, that's a revelation, it's a word from the Lord. When daylight comes, you look around for them, they're gone into their hole wherever they came from. They, they don't want the word of the Lord. They don't want to pay the price involved with it. I remember when I, I was in, in a Pentecostal denomination at the time I come into the, this walk, uh, rather reluctantly at the time. And a, another brother in the same denomination, uh, he had a terrible time because he wanted to stay in the denomination, wanted to walk with the Lord, and oh, now they were putting all kinds of pressure on him. And he'd come over to me, and I said, well, just walk with the Lord. What do you, what's bothering you? And he looked at me, and he, and he used uh, some very rough language. He said, it's different between you and me. He said, I know you have the walk with the Lord that you want, but when it comes to denomination, you never gave a damn anyway. And he was telling the truth. I never really cared. That was the way he expressed it. I have never that much been concerned about a, an organization with all of its frailties and its politics and everything else. Amen. I just... I just uh, felt that I, I know the word tells us you greet the holy brethren with a kiss, but I never liked the place that they wanted me to kiss. <laughs> I, it grieved my spirit. If that seems a little bit too strong, forgive me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> dear, are we going to shock our dear South Africans here? <laughs> I... <laughs> the idea, though, the idea of trying to maintain uh, the, the, the favor of man with the fear of man upon your heart can't be present. All right, let's go on. Where are we? We're ready. We're ready for the showdown, all right? And this was a beautiful day. It was a day of fire and a day of rain. They needed both. And they said, let the God that answers by fire, let him be God. Now, listen how Elijah proceeded to treat the uh, priesthood, you know, the religious ministry of the day. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one ox for yourself. Prepare it first, for you are many. Call on the name of the Lord your God, but put no fire under it. Then they took the ox that was given them. They prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Oh, Baal answers. But there was no voice and no one answered. 
<laughs> and they leaped about the altar which they had made. But if you notice the margin, it says that they limped. Now, why, why did they limp? It, it's a leap you sort of think of like, the, ooh, 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 you know, sort of American Indian war dance before the scalp. But it isn't, it isn't that way. It really isn't that way. They limped some way, some way their ceremonial dance required that they limp. And they took swords and they cut themselves and lancelets and they made the blood flow. <clears throat> How many would like to know why they did this? I would too. I am. <laughs> it came up, and it came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, call out with a loud voice for he is God. Either he's occupied or gone aside or is on a journey. <laughs> or, <laughs> or perhaps he's asleep and needs to be awakened. <laughs> <laughs> so they cried with a loud voice and they cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out on them. And it came about when midday was past that they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. The, literally, again, the Hebrew word is prophesied. Uh, you, you got that? All right. There was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been done, uh, torn down. The first step toward the restoration is that you must have the altar restored. Amen. That's right. The way of seeking God. You know, at this time we have so much worship and praise and seeking the Lord maybe some of you forget the pit from which you were digged maybe you forget what it was like to find the days of wanting to break through to God not being able to do it I'm very grateful God's giving what he is but don't think for a minute I'm going to give you this advice and say that the walk has all the answers. Potentially it does. But not yet. But it's the finest thing I've seen because it has, it has a progressive unfolding of revelation that has been consistent upon revelation that have come. And any time that you can type up prophecies and you can keep them in files for 20 years and, and not find contradictions in the teaching or in the personal ministry revelation. Something that's been that consistent, Amen. you've got something from God. Right. Nobody's memory could even be that perfect right. that they didn't cross themselves up someplace. <clears throat> by divine wisdom and by the same token, we are in a position where we are going to have so much more revelation, such more, uh, more of a revelation of the Lord himself in the days ahead. This is what I like about this. It, the promise that is not empty and vain. We are be walking in it and we're going to continue to walk in more. Well, he repaired the altar of the Lord and it says, with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he makes a trench round about the altar. They put the ox on it. They bring big pitchers of water and they uh, pour, and I was a little pitch, I probably like the carry on the head, you know. And, and uh, that was no easy thing. Didn't they have to bring it up from, well, never mind, I'm not really sure. Is it by the sea? Mm -hmm. and they fill four pitchers of water. They do it three times. That makes 12 big pitchers of water. The trench is filled with water. And then he starts his prayer. Beautiful prayer. O Lord, answer me that this people may know that thou, O Lord, art God, and thou hast turned their heart back again. Beautiful prayer. Don't you think so? Amen. Do you like it? Of course, half the verse proceeding, uh, you know, is there. But all, all told, there's less than two verses 
there of the prayer that changed everything that day. And let that be a lesson to you brothers. Right? Shrink it down. Lack of not sin, the word said. And I think that could even be applied to some prayers. Now, get right down to it. The Lord's Prayer is very short. It's not the multitude of words. But if you really prayed the Lord's Prayer with a great deal of meditation, and I've done this, I've spent a whole night getting through the Lord's Prayer. I mean all night long. It, to really pray a prayer is not the amount of time but it's how that you really voice the will of God in that prayer with the proper faith in your own heart. Well, the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the burnt offering, the wood and the stones and the dust, licked up the water that was in the trench. <laughs> Isn't that light? Well, how'd you like to have fire that would burn up water? Would you like to have that? When the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. So Elijah says, Seize the prophets of Baal, and they brought them down the sea to the brook Kishon, and they slew them there. And then, it's still not only a day of fire, but it's a day, it's a day of what? Of rain. So he tells the king, you better, there's going to be a heavy shower. You better go home. Elijah went up on the top of the mountain. It says he crouched down and put his face between his knees. And that's not an easy feat for an old man to do. I can't do that. Can you? How many can put your head between your knees? Anybody here? Ah, uh, you're kidding me. Can you? How many can put your head between your knees? Well, it must be 10 or 15 percent that can do that. Goes to show that old prophet was all right, wasn't he? Amen. Now, he must have tuned into something of a real excellence in his physical body. He's bowed over there. Seven times he sends a servant out to look for uh, a cloud. And he finally sees a little cloud coming up, as small as a man's hand. And he said, go say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down so that the heavy shower does not stop you. So it came about in a little while. The sky grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy shower. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. But now this, this is the payoff. The hand of the Lord was on Elijah. And he girded up his loins and he outran Ahab to Jezreel. <laughs> I tell you, he just, he just wasn't standing around. Uh, he wasn't standing around when he was doing that. Here the king with, with the chariot and the best of horses that probably in the kingdom. You know, these kings, they don't go, for, you, can, you can believe it, it wasn't a couple old burrows he had hitched up there. <laughs> he had so, a, real, a real team and they took off. But of course it's raining, and I suppose that slowed him down a little bit. But boy, you can hear that old, that old war hoop, and here comes, here comes the prophet with his whiskers blowing in the breeze, just passing right up. <laughs> and he outran him to the gates of the city. And I, can, I can see the old smirk on Elijah's face, you know, as the gates open and he bows to the old apostate king, ushering him back into his palace. The next story is a sad one. It's a story of transition, which after one victory you often find the areas uh, within your heart of defeat that prevent you from going on to the next victory. These he, God has to deal with so that you can go on to become a, even a greater conqueror in the Lord. Now, all of this has this application in our minds, I think. At least it does to me. The Elijah Company of people, I like to call them that, a group of people that are coming forth with the same spirit of Elijah upon them. The spirit of Elijah has been very close to the earth again for probably the last 15 years or so. Now, there's no way I can prove these things to you. And it's much wiser that I not speak of the things of the spirit realm that, that you cannot verify or back up by scripture. You, you understand. You folks are having a big enough problem with what's written here and I don't want to give you anything more. You know what I mean. But that very spirit of Elijah seems to be here and I think many of you realize that. There's a spirit in the earth that's getting a hold of a remnant of God's people. Making them bold like Elijah. Giving them a word for the Lord. 
Actually, they are instruments in the hand of the Lord to bring a showdown between the almost godless professors of Christianity and what God really wants to do. Don't ever get it, your idea in the mind that the world without God is alone being judged. It's the apostates that have known him too and drawn back. These also are in the scope of his pronounced judgments. But God is going to see this age close with two things. Judgment that is going to come to vindicate the Lord and his presence that is going to impart a double portion to this Elijah company. And in this case, it was Elisha who received the double portion. I don't believe we're going to see a diminishing amount of anointing. This Feast of Tabernacles has witnessed a greater moving of the Lord in the earth than the, pre the prior ones. We've never had a time that so many of you would say, yes, God has been speaking to me. I have a real word from the Lord. Your life this last year has been directed more and more by the Spirit of the Lord. It's, that trend is not going to change. Our, our light is not turning to darkness because there's great repentance and there's great heart searching upon the whole walk today. If you ask what are the most popular books that have come out in the training of ministries, it's the books that are most quickly exhausted. There are about four or five books on repentance and its place within the life of a ministry. These are the most popular books. They're the ones that disappear and are out of print quicker. All the other, the mechanics of ministry, the gifts, the things that you think are ambitious and the people would want them. But when it comes down to it, they want their heart to walk with God. Amen. And the repentance is there. And because of that, we're going to see an increase in what God is doing in the way of revelation and guidance. Your dedication is directly related to the revelation that God gives you. Look for the prophetic company to emerge until it's going to be a wonder among all of God's people. And they'll say, how is it that they get this leading from the Lord? Why is it that a word comes? There's no secret about it. There isn't any great key that you can point to, except that for a long time we've been listening. For a long time the Lord has been circumcising our heart and ears. For a long time we've been learning the ways of the Lord. For a long time we've been learning the deep basic things of repentance that search a man's heart and help to help him to walk broken in his spirit before the Lord continually. These things we have been learning. And others would come and say, here, we want to do that too. There's no way that you can help them to do it. There are no shortcuts in this. There's no substitute for walking with God with a broken spirit. There just isn't. There's no way that you can say, here, we can lay hands on you, give you a gift, do this for, for that for you. There isn't any substitute for walking with God. There isn't any substitute for being broken in your spirit before the Lord. You can fail a lot of times, and you've seen people get worst out when they fail, but not when they have a broken spirit. Righteous man will fall seven times, and the Lord will uphold him with his hands. There's something about them that we see have a faith that's incurable. We have everlasting arms that lift us up. It's not because we are unique and better than any people that ever walked with God before us, but because we've had this one thing we have learned out to humble our hearts before the Lord in real repentance. Amen. We've learned to be a repentant people. Amen. We've learned to have the meekness. We've learned, we've learned to to bind and bring down everything of arrogance that might come against, against us by being in our heart. Amen. Amen. This is the way of Elijah, the Tishbite. It's the way of the Elijah company. Bless you. Oh, we bless thy name.